Thank you for joining us today at St. Paul's Hospital. I'm Eric Harris. I'm the chair of the board of uh, Providence Health. I want to begin by acknowledging with gratitude that we're meeting today on the traditional ancestral and unceded territories of the Musqueam, Squamish, and Tsleil-Waututh people. We honor their guidance in all our work. I'm honored to be joined today by BC Minister of Health, the Honorable Adrian Dix. Mr. Dix has the amazing capacity to truly understand healthcare in BC and is tireless in arranging support uh, necessary to make improvements. I predict that future generations of British Columbians will owe Minister Dix a great debt for the improvements he is making. I'm also joined by Dr. Julio Montaner, the Executive Director and Physician-in-Chief of the BC Centre for Excellence in HIV AIDS here at Providence Healthcare. I have the deepest personal respect for his work and his unending commitment to those who suffered from HIV AIDS. He is both a futurist and he is still able to be a fully dedicated clinician. We consider him to be one of the most distinguished physicians in Canada and elsewhere. Today marks Wor World AIDS Day and the start of the Indigenous AIDS Awareness Week. We are now presented with an opportunity to honor those who have lost their lives to AIDS and those, and those living with AIDS and to reflect on the history of AIDS which continues to challenge us globally. World AIDS Today also allows us to raise awareness of the enormous strides made in addressing HIV AIDS epidemic. This is particularly the case in BC, where thanks to the work done by the BC Center for Excellence HIV AIDS, with the support of the gov provincial government and a strong network of institutional and community partners, HIV AIDS has now been transferred into what is now largely a chronic managed condition. The advent of highly active antiretroviral therapy and the concept of treatment as, as prevention where early HIV AIDS treatment was found to stop transmission has resulted in this change. The work done in BC CFE at this hospital has had an impact on that ep epidemic which as you will hear has been truly groundbreaking. We wish to express appreciation to the provincial government which followed the evidence and funded innovative programs to test, treat, and prevent HIV AIDS. BC has set an example. The rest of Canada should follow in our view, to, we hope, to in setting a national response to HIV AIDS. With those remarks, it's now my pleasure to introduce the minister, Adrian Dix, who will provide an update regarding BC's response to HIV AIDS. Thank you. Thank you. And, and uh, thank you very much. I'm, of course, honored to be here on the territory of the Musqueam of the Squamish of the Tsleil-Waututh uh, First Nations. And there are many places where one could recognize the work done in the community, in acute care across the BC healthcare system, in our collective response over decades and multiple governments. To, uh, to HIV AIDS, but there's no more significant place, I think, than here at St. Paul's Hospital. And I think, uh, to start with, I think it's important, Eric, to recognize the work of Providence Healthcare, the world leading work of Providence Healthcare in this, uh, in this area of care. It has been breathtaking and it has required uh, a Providence Healthcare organization that's both deeply connected everything we do in the public health care system, but also I think uniquely innovative and determined to uh, provide care where others were failing to provide care. And on this question, as we explore this, being here at St. Paul's and understanding the extent of the compassion and innovation at this place provided by uh, Providence Healthcare is remarkable. We have done so many things together in the last few years. We're building a new St. Paul's. It's going to be both hard and easy to leave this building in some ways easy and some ways hard because of the, some of the hist history I talked about that we are um, building together uh, 
new health care facilities to assist all people. Like you said, St. Vincent's something we've been waiting for years to do. St. Paul's waiting for years to do, doing it together. St. Vincent's waiting years to do, doing it together. New care facilities for seniors in Comox and recently announced in uh, Comox Courtney and recently announced in, uh, in Prince George. The exceptional work being done. Really, I would, I would argue some equivalent work to the work done by Dr. Montagne on HIV AIDS, the work being done by Providence Healthcare with the community on issues of mental health and addictions care. Uh, Providence is an innovator in healthcare, and we're really honored, Eric, to be here uh, today with you to mark World AIDS Day, but also to recognize the central role in the world that this hospital and Providence Healthcare has uh, played in, uh, in the care for HIV AIDS. Obviously, um, today, December 1st, is World AIDS Day. And every day, uh, every year on this day, people around the world unite to show support for those who live with and are impacted by HIV AIDS. We remember those who died from the illness and we celebrate their lives. And we also reaffirm our commitment to supporting people living with HIV and AIDS and to breaking down the barriers caused by stigma that prevent individuals from receiving the care and the support that they need. HIV is a virus that infects cells of the human immune system and destroys their function. AIDS is the most advanced stage of HIV infection, where a person's immune system can no longer fulfill its role of fighting off infection and diseases. Since the 1980, the virus has caused significant health issue for people in our province and across the world. It has caused tremendous, sometimes unspeakable pain and suffering for its victims and heartaches for their loved ones. From the start of the epidemic, BC has been a global leader in the fight against HIV AIDS, committing to providing resources to people in need, including education and treatment measures to combat HIV and AIDS. And I'm grateful to be standing here with Dr. Julio Montagnier and staff from the BC Center for Excellence in HIV AIDS, which has been a global leader in the fight against HIV and AIDS, and I'd like to recognize and offer my profound gratitude for the efforts and leadership they have shown, world-leading leadership, courageous leadership, a, a willingness to put patient-centered care absolutely first and beyond anything. The groundbreaking treatment of prevention strategy was first implemented in BC and is now adopted in jurisdictions around the world, and surely when you see the differential rates of HIV and AIDS in other jurisdictions in Canada still needs to be adopted everywhere in our country where the, and, and in some ways the significant challenge of HIV and AIDS is of course people move to British Columbia, move to our healthcare system and that is a significant challenge but we need everywhere because people in Saskatchewan and people in Manitoba and people in Ontario and people across the country deserve access to the, the innovation that Dr. Montagna and his team has brought to British Columbia Healthcare. This effective Made in BC approach has also laid the foundation for the United Nations 90-90-90 and 95-95-95 targets to end the global AIDS epidemic by 2030. Treatment as prevention has also been applied to combat other illnesses including Hep C, Hepatitis C, diabetes and chronic diseases, providing better treatment measures for many patients in BC. As prevention is critical in HIV AIDS, BC has also been providing the preventative drug treatment known as HIV PrEP to those who may be exposed to the virus. Daily use of HIV PrEP reduces the risk of acquiring HIV by over 95%. Repeat that, by over 95%. It, it is with these measures that we're seeing results. I just want to note on the issue of PrEP that um, it was one of the early things I did in my period as Minister of Health, Dr. Montagnier said that if we do this, and he also in an innovative way provided access, low cost access to drugs, if we do this, we can give people back aspects of their lives that they had not had for decades and achieve this 95% target. And of course, naturally, when you get that kind of note from Dr. Montagnier, you say, well, where do I sign? It's true. And what's extraordinary about it, and Dr. Montagnier will speak about this, is everything that was predicted, everything that was predicted came true. And that's because people are not just supported, they are supported with their other needs in healthcare when they're dealing with HIV AIDS and when they're dealing with the BC Center for Excellence. It is extraordinary. In 2021, 
there were 150 new cases of HIV do diagnosed in BC within that year. This is a decrease of approximately 84 percent from the peak of 929 new HIV cases recorded in BC in 1987. And since the start of the epidemic, the number of AIDS-related deaths has decreased by more than 90 percent. The percentage points cannot capture the impact that has on families and individuals. It is profound. The work on education, treatment, and prevention has been transformational, meaning people li living with HIV AIDS are living longer and with a better quality of life. And now, as, as we are announcing today, I'm so pleased to say that, the, that new HIV diagnoses in BC are at an all-time low, so low, in fact, that we are here acknowledging the virtual end of the HIV epidemic here in British Columbia. The work of the BC Center for Excellence and HIV AIDS, other partner organizations, and our government has made that that work has been simply exceptional. And I'm incredibly, incredibly proud of the work that we do and will continue to do. This year's World AIDS Day theme is Let Communities Lead. I'd like to recognize the contributions of local community groups and organizations that have been integral in BC's response to HIV AIDS. They are key allies in the battle to end the epidemic, and we all couldn't do our work without their support. On the front lines, they are providing education about HIV AIDS and its prevention, and connecting people with um, access to testing, treatment, and support. I want to express my deep gratitude for their incredible efforts responding to HIV AIDS. By continuing to bring together health experts, community organizations, and people living with HIV AIDS, we can design services to better need to better help those in need. We will continue to work closely and do our work together with the BC Centre for Excellence and support their research to develop effective treatments that improve the lives of people throughout BC and the world. We will continue to support the extraordinary community groups and organizations who provide such important services that will help us reach our collective goal of ending the epidemic. Today we also recognize the beginning of Indigenous AIDS Awareness Week. Our government is committed to eradicating racism in the healthcare system and beyond so people feel comfortable accessing the health services they need, including education, testing, and treatment to combat HIV AIDS. We continue to make progress in implementing the 24 recommendations of the In Plain Sight Report. And we, will work, we are working closely with our regional health authorities, the First Nations health authorities, and Indigenous partners to administer the Seek and Treat for Optimal Prevention of HIV AIDS, the Stop HIV AIDS program. This program ensures that we engage in equitable, and culturally safe ways to ensure HIV treatment is administered and provided for those who need them. But we know we still have a long road ahead of us to achieve meaningful reconciliation, especially in healthcare. And we will continue to work with and support Indigenous patients and their families to receive the care they need, free from bias and discrimination. I want to acknowledge you know, Dalton and the entire team at uh, Providence Healthcare. I want to, of course, thank uh, BC Center for Excellence in HIV AIDS and Dr. Montagnier for their professionalism, dedication, and their idealism, which is so important to the work we do together, to all the community groups involved. They have and are continuing to help people in BC live healthier lives, preventing people from acquiring HIV and ending the HIV AIDS epidemic. It is a story worth telling and telling again of what people can achieve when they work together to, to do extraordinary things and lead the world. And I'm very proud to be here at St. Paul's as this great hospital that has meant such a difference to people, to thousands, tens of thousands of people on this issue and others. So proud to be with you all today. Thank you. Thank you, Minister. This is not uh, the first time that we come together to make a significant announcement. Uh, uh, I'd like to acknowledge in front of everybody uh, that uh, Minister Dix and uh, the provincial government have been extraordinarily supportive of the work that we are uh, trying to do here. And so um, uh, to come together today uh, to share with you the evidence that supports the statements that both Eric, uh, the chairman of our board, and uh, and uh, Minister Dix have uh, made, uh, gives me a great satisfaction because, as the Minister said, um, uh, we are here today at what I think is a historical moment uh, where we are basically 
uh, seeing uh, the virtual end of the domestic transmission of HIV uh, and thereby the uh, virtual end of the AIDS epidemic in the province of British Columbia. So without further ado, I'd like to share with you the actual data that supports that uh, claim. These are the key epidemiological indicators that we are concerned about uh, when we monitor HIV AIDS in British Columbia. And as you can see here, uh, uh, while uh, treatment has worked extremely well at preventing people from dying, uh, and therefore uh, we have seen an increase of uh, or over one and a half fold uh, in terms of the number of people that are living with HIV, uh, we are at the same time seeing that this curve is starting to bend downwards uh, because, as I often say, uh, the median age of the cohort of people infected with HIV in the province it has always been my age. Uh, it was my age when we started, and it is my age, uh, hopefully, when we ended together. Uh, and the reason for that is uh, that the pool of people that are becoming infected in British Columbia has shrunk significantly, so we're basically dealing with an epidemic that predominantly has already taking place. And to illustrate that, the benefit that these individuals have seen in terms of uh, 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 progression to AIDS, for example, I'll share with you the fact that uh, the latest estimate uh, from our group, uh, these are the data that the DMDS Lima have generated, showed a 90% increase in estimated incidence and an 89% decrease in new diagnosis. The discrepancy between these two numbers is technical. What happens is a new diagnosis uh, can take place today uh, but uh, the individual's infection may have occurred a month, a year, or a decade before. So when you adjust for that, uh, you end up with a true incidence, which is the new uh, in, uh, infections that occur on an even period of time. Today, we have uh, reached the threshold that the United Nations define as the end of uh, the epidemic phase of the uh, HIV uh, uh, epidemic in our midst. This by itself, is worthy of celebration. More importantly, uh, and this was the uh, work that drove me into the epidemic, is the desire to stop people from dying prematurely uh, from HIV and AIDS related causes. Uh, while the situation was devastating in the early days of the epidemic, so in the 90s, as you see here, uh, the peak was quite significant. Uh, you see that with the development of highly active antiretroviral therapy, uh, uh, we were able to drop that dramatically. And again, we reached a plateau that many would have celebrated, but not us. Uh, we wanted to see the end of AIDS, and therefore we pursued treatment and prevention as the next phase of this campaign. And as you can see here, uh, that had a dramatic effect, so that today we have a 97% decrease in AIDS-related premature death in the province of British Columbia. This is well beyond uh, what uh, uh, the United Nations uh, has agreed uh, is the definition for the end of AIDS as an epidemic concern. Yes, there are sporadic cases of people uh, that are still, unfortunately, uh, suffering uh, uh, irreparably from HIV AIDS, and that's why we're redoubling our efforts uh, to reach these individuals to address all of their needs what the minister referred to as patient-centered care. We're not trying to solve the disease. We're trying to help people who have multiple other competing priorities that need to be addressed. And with the help of the minister and with the help of the provincial government, we're supposed to do more of that uh, in the years to come. Uh, with your permission, getting a little bit more technical, uh, I wanted to share some uh, results that are yet unpublished, uh, looking at the number of genetically linked uh, cases uh, uh, that are being identified in the province. Briefly, uh, every time that individual uh, comes through our doors, uh, and that's a, sort of not a literal uh, uh, description, anybody that has a laboratory test related to HIV uh, monitoring in the province, uh, again, that, that sample gets centrally characterized using uh, genetic ma ma mapping of the uh, virus so that we can uh, give the individual the best possible advice uh, in terms of what uh, medications would be most effective in, in any given case. This has been incredibly valuable and uh, 
uh, remains something that is not really used widely around the world. We think it should be a top priority to adopt this kind of monitoring because it really helps uh, making the right decisions, the appropriate decisions for every given patient. Beyond that, uh, Jeff Joy and a number of others in our group uh, have developed a technique that allows us to geographically map uh, the relatedness of the different uh, viruses in that community uh, so that we can identify uh, clusters of HIV transmission. Uh, we do this with the intent of understanding where are the foci of HIV transmission. And so then we can deploy our resources, uh, health personnel, etc., uh, to uh, help those individuals uh, to uh, help themselves of the resources that are available uh, through our programs. Uh, if you are infected with HIV, we would facilitate your access to antiretroviral therapy. Uh, if you are uh, attached to that cluster, uh, behaviorally, so to speak, uh, we would like to offer you pre-exposure prophylaxis, something that, as the minister described, uh, was pioneered under Minister Dick's leadership. By combining treatment prevention with PrEP, we have been able to shut down uh, most of the clusters that, are, uh, that were actually avail um, active in the province. And what you see here is that British Columbia, uh, since, since the inception of PrEP, uh, has seen a dramatic decrease, as I promised you, Minister, uh, in the cluster-associated cases, so that we are now reaching an all-time low. This emphasizes the importance of uh, uh, us working together to stop HIV transmission, not only in British Columbia, but elsewhere, because failing to do so creates a situation uh, where, first, uh, there are provinces that are uh, uh, suffering in a, uh, unnecessarily from uh, an increased burden of uh, HIV. Uh, so, for example, in a different scale and using a different metric, I'll show you the per capita cluster cases here, and you see that over time they have been uh, decreasing significantly. Uh, bear with me, this is a semi-logarithmic scale. Uh, just follow the graphic. Uh, the province B, and not here to uh, point fingers, uh, uh, is a province um, on the other side of the border here somewhere, uh, and you see that uh, the situation is very uh, concerning. Uh, on the contrary, province C, which is also uh, a Canadian province, uh, uh, the situation was significantly worse for a long period of time, but uh, once they uh, decided to move on and adopt the strategies that we have in place, and with our help uh, in terms of monitoring uh, the uh, genetic profile of their epidemic, you see that as soon as those programs were put in place, the effect of uh, uh, doing so has been quite dramatic. I'm using this slide to illustrate the fact that there is a way forward for all of us. And it is critical that the rest of Canada emulates the success of our programs, not just by talking about it, but actually doing it. Because if they do so, then the whole of Canada would benefit by decreasing the burden of disease, uh, which is currently, as you can imagine, uh, uh, moving freely across the borders, and so creating further uh, uh, burden for the province at a time in which our healthcare uh, is ill-prepared uh, to continue to uh, distract itself with uh, 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 clinical situations that are truly uh, avoidable. <laughs> to illustrate this further, I'll share with you the situation in British Columbia uh, and compare that uh, with the situation in the rest of the country. And what you see here is that the uh, HIV incident cases in British Columbia, as shown in, my, in your left-hand side, uh, uh, showed a peak early on when the epidemic started. Uh, it came down very quickly uh, with the early behavioral modification, but it reached a plateau until such time as we developed highly active antiretroviral therapy in 1986. Upon the implementation of highly active antiretroviral therapy, as I described before, uh, we saw a dramatic decrease uh, in HIV new infections or incidents, uh, and then we, with treatment of prevention, that declined further to reach an all-time low. This is the kind of behavior that we would expect to see uh, in a program that is rolling out effective strategies across the whole program. Unfortunately, when you look at the rest of the country, the first peak is similar. Uh, as I described, 
but unfortunately, after that, uh, there is no discernible effect of heart or treatment as prevention, despite the fact that, in theory, uh, the rest of the country has bought into the idea. We had to stop talking about it. We need to start doing it. And until we do so, uh, the uh, national, the Canadian epidemic will not be conquered. In conclusion, the impact of HIV AIDS uh, treatment and prevention in BC, in combination with PrEP, has shown that we can markedly decrease almost completely over 90% decrease in morbidity, that is disease, mortality, that is premature death, transmission, that is new infections, and cost. Because at the end of the day, the investments that we're making today uh, are, uh, have a huge return on the investment. In fact, we save money in the long term by doing this. There is no reason for us not to do this. And I would like to say today, as the minister indicated, that HIV treatment and prevention has contributed to targeted disease elimination and enhanced healthcare sustainability. And there is no reason why we should not be organizing the whole of our healthcare system in this way so that we can actually not just deal with individual uh, health problems, but with societal health programs so that we can contract the burden of disease for the benefit of us all. Uh, 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 from a disease perspective, from a social perspective, and from an economic perspective, perspective. A number of years ago, when I first came out with the notion of treatment prevention, uh, uh, the economists asked the question whether or not this could represent the end of AIDS. I argued that that would be the case. I can now tell you that BC has demonstrated that treatment uh, as prevention combined with PrEP can end the epidemic phase of HIV AIDS. However, ending HIV AIDS won't be feasible unless we all do it. Thus, we must redouble our effort to mobilize the global political will, both in Canada and the world, to deliver on the promise of our research. I'd like to thank you all for uh, your attention, and I would like to uh, encourage you to uh, work with us to mobilize the political will that is necessary to once and for all end the epidemic, the whole epidemic within our lifetime. Thank you. We have, we have a few minutes for questions. If you have a question, please ask the question and you may have one follow up. Thank you. Any questions? No questions? Just one question. Um, it's a very good, a good news situation. Yeah. Um, is there kind of a little quick, these are the things that helped us get here? Is it, is it just prep or has it been information and upgrading the, of, of uh, condoms and, and other STI prevention techniques? What, what has gotten us to this point? Well, I think Dr. Uh, Dr. Montaigne talked about it, and I'll ask him to speak to it in a few minutes. I think it's, it, it's all of the above, right? It, it's extraordinary community engagement, the involvement of community groups that got active on this file. And you see that in the first decline in cases. That was largely public health and community action. Right? It was the first phase. We've seen this in other, in our recent pandemic, where early on it was public action and then vaccination. In this case, what we had in BC was public action and then some of the most innovative healthcare work that has ever been done in the world, led by Dr. Montagnier, led by this hospital in part, led by, uh, by uh, the community to change the way we dealt with treatment. Uh, one of the things that is so moving about what happens at the BC Center for Excellence is that it's not passive and responsive. It is engaging in people's lives in a positive way to help them live fuller lives and to deal with something that profoundly affected not only people's um, uh, mortality, but the quality of their lives. And what is so impressive about how it was done as a community the reason we can be so proud of it is that it was been done without judgment. And that's what's so impressive about what the BC Center for Excellence in HIV AIDS has done. So world leading science, world leading Canadian community action, something that has inspired the whole world, but not enough Canadian provinces. 
to deal with it fundamentally. You cannot just deal with HIV AIDS in one province. You need to do it across the country and then across the world. And uh, I think Dr. Montagnier's work has been an inspiration for that. So great science, great community action, people who are focused on supporting and caring for one another. I think it models what we need in a healthcare system and also, I think, uh, says when we're dealing with growing in higher levels of diabetes, which we haven't talked about as much, we've been talking about uh, COVID-19 a lot and we've been talking about um, obviously the overdose public health emergency, but growing rates of diabetes in our society and the challenges of cancer care. You need uh, people to do what Dr. Montagnier and St. Paul's Hospital and Providence Healthcare and the province of BC has done, which is to engage in prevention as well as treatment, treatment as prevention. And that's, uh, that's how you achieve, I think, great success. But I think people in BC um, perhaps don't fully recognize the extent of the achievement here, but the people, uh, but I think people who've been engaged in this issue done, and they're, they want to do more, and, and we want to do more too. Maybe, uh, Will, you can say Sure, thank you, Minister. Um, I'll, I'll briefly say, uh, the Minister gave you the answer. Uh, this is uh, uh, a, a, a simple formula that we have developed over the years, which is very easy to adopt. And where the only thing that he failed to mention is that it requires political will. And the reason why he's here is because he has provided the political will to allow us to do what we needed to do to virtually end the epidemic. Uh, and I have nothing else to say. Um, and I'm going to ask, uh, if you don't mind, Denise, um, to say a few words. I'm not going to say anything about her. I'll let her uh, say whatever she thinks is appropriate in this circumstance. All right. I, my name is Denise Wozniak. I have had HIV since 1989. I actually found out that I had HIV in 1994. I had no idea before that. And I found out one of the worst ways possible when my six month old daughter had pneumonia, was taken to Children's Hospital and was found to have AIDS. She was given two years to live. In actual fact, she died three months later. I was told that I'm, who knows, you might live five years. It was like, whoa, five years. And then the medication changed. And I'm here today to show you what happens when a province takes this seriously, when a hospital takes this seriously and makes changes that it will allow people to live because this is a stigmatized illness. It still is. But when people are accepting of you and when they care about you and they want to see you survive, it makes a huge difference. I've seen way too much of Julio in the last few years. <laughs> I see him so much for my appointments, but it's always a pleasure to see him because he cares about me. He cares how I'm doing. And I'm glad to say now that I've lived with a man who is not HIV positive. For 10 years, we've been married. What happened? He Googled HIV and he looked at what's the chances I'm gonna get infected. We need to use those online portals to try and find out what, what's happening with HIV now? Because people are not up to date. And it's amazing. My biggest fear right now is what's going to happen because I'm getting pretty old. And I know that I'm going to eventually need probably home care. Is a ho home health nurse going to come and see me? What happens when I go into assisted living? How am I going to be treated? But I know Minister Adrian Dix has got that under control, right? Working on it. <laughs> Working on it. All right, that's my biggest fear right now. But I just thank the Lord for people like Julio, who's just, he's an amazing person. Anybody who's a patient will tell you what a difference this man has made in their life. And I'm still here today. So if you have any questions, I'd be glad to take them. Yes, okay. <laughs> uh, you mentioned you had, you found out you had HIV AIDS in 1989? 
I actually was infected in 89. I know that because it's the only year I was single. And I had three boyfriends in that time. One of them passed on HIV. By that time, by the time I was 29, I'd been with four different men. That's not a lot for somebody as good looking as this, you know? <laughs> so. <laughs> well, what I want, you've kind of seen the, the broad spectrum of, of, oh, yes. of care over mm -hmm. You've seen how the, the drugs have changed and how yes. the, the yes. care has changed. What's been the biggest milestone in, in your opinion? Well, for me personally, the biggest milestone is that it's not being passed on to children because women are getting tested during pregnancy. And when they're on medication, they can't pass it on to their children. That's huge, really big for me personally. I remember going to Dr. Montana's office, and I would be in a long line of people waiting outside his office. Remember that? And there must have been 20 people there at least. We'd wait two hours to get in and see him. And now I go to a nice waiting room. There's maybe three other people. We can even talk on the phone. It's incredible, the difference. And so many people I know have died of this disease, and so many women have died of this disease. People I, I have helped peer counseling for women when they find out when they're in hospital, and they're infected way before that. It, it's tragic. It's traumatic. And I believe that people like this and our province make such a difference in our lives. And it allows us to go out and talk about it and spread the news of the good news of what's happening today. It's incredibly good news. And I just hope it becomes much more that way in Canada because you do wonder what happens if I want to move where I'm living because it's pretty expensive in Vancouver right now. If I want to go out to Nova Scotia or anything like that, what's going to happen if I want to change provinces? Is this going to be a difficulty for me? When I had HIV, I should say that when the medication came in, it wasn't like I just got on medication, everything's fine. I was allergic to a lot of medications. Julio had to keep changing my medications to find the right one. And now I'm just incredibly lucky. I'm still here and I'm spreading the word. I'm trying to tell people, you know, it's different now. We used to hear a lot about the cocktail. Yes. The giant mix of pills that the yes. states. Is that the case today or is it? Is yes. It well, process? well, just to let you know, I did an interview a long time ago with Vicky Gabro. At that time, I was taking 29 pills a day. I take one pill a day now. One pill. It's amazing. I can, I can take it anywhere I go. I could take it right now. Nobody would know if I was take, what I was taking. But if you get up 29 pills, it's kind of a, like, what the heck's going on over there? Yeah. So, so it, it's a huge difference, yes. It's, you, it's wonderful. Do you need to speak to that? Because yes. Sure. Um, thank you, uh, Denise. Uh, you're terrific, of course, as always. Um, you, you had to sort of... Um, um, correct for uh, our mutual admiration uh, when uh, Denise is speaking, but I, I think what she, the point that she's making is a very true one. Um, uh, the BC Center for Excellence, uh, uh, thanks to the support of the government, and Minister Dix in particular, uh, we are able to offer every single British Columbia whatever is best for him or her uh, under the circumstances from a medical perspective. The treatments that we had once upon a time were very complex. They, it was very difficult. What Denise described as Julio's uh, uh, you know, waiting line, it was a disaster. Uh, I, I used to run 12-hour clinics, uh, even without uh, doing my paperwork. I would do the paperwork at night, uh, and that was day after day after day. But our research shows the way forward. We simplify the treatments, and today the treatments are relatively much simpler. Many of them require one pill once a day, uh, and, uh, and there are some even that uh, you can get by with uh, intermittent treatments. And, uh, we're not here to discuss therapeutics, but I can guarantee you that anything that is out there that you need, whether it is approved by the system or not, if this is what you need, we will work with the government, provincially and federally, to make it happen. And if not, as Tico Kerr about it. I actually have a follow-up for you, doctor. Um, the goal is ending AIDS by 2030. More affluent countries, they're probably going to be reaching out to you later today. <laughs> how, how do we do this? Um, 
But the age epidemic is, is really uh, hitting uh, less, less developed countries in Africa really hard. How do we get them the help they need? Well, that's the interesting part. Uh, uh, I. Um, I spent the last many years working internationally, and many people know I was a, a senior advisor to the United Nations uh, for a number of years, uh, and I basically wrote the plan for them on how to do what we have now demonstrated that works in British Columbia in the rest of the world. The United Nations approved the plan. Uh, it's called the 90 target, followed by the 95 95, 95 target by, uh, uh, and the details are not really all that important, but. But the beauty of this is that that plan has now been adopted by every country in the world. That is a made in BC uh, uh, a strategy to end the epidemic globally. And actually, there is no debate anymore. The problem is that uh, in order for the strategy to work, we, actually, we, we had to stop talking about it. And, and, and I want to say something that may be uh, slightly controversial, but I just came back from a visit uh, back home in Latin America. I celebrated World AIDS Day a couple of days ahead of time in Buenos Aires, uh, where I was lecturing on this very issue. Uh, and it was incredibly well received. But I faced a lot of people uh, who would like to pontificate uh, and actually make moral judgments that preclude people from accessing the services that they need. So we need to get the prejudice out we need to start being more pragmatic and recognize that people are going to live the lives that they're going to live, and our job is to help them, to help them and inform them and educate them to the extent that we can so that they can make the best possible decisions for themselves. Everything that we're doing in British Columbia, in essence, is available in Buenos Aires and in Cape Town and in Indonesia and in the United States and in Europe, and it's all that work has been done except that it has to be done, and it has to be done quickly so that we can end the epidemic. There are no secrets. The plan is out there, it's available, and we're making all of our efforts to support countries that want to do it. We're actually supporting Ukraine with genetic testing today as we speak, because we want to end this epidemic. So we're here and we're available to help anybody, other provinces, other countries, and we encourage people to reach out because we want to work with you to make this go away.